So I'm not sure if you heard one of the comments coming through, but I'll just recap it. KKR, they're sticking, speaking of private credit, they're sticking to the, the top high quality, the top end of the capital structure still. I know you guys are big on that as well, high quality. Or are you tempted now, given all the players coming in, given the yields on offer, to start looking, looking down the capital structure? Um, well, thanks for having us. And yeah, the, uh, sorry to go private, directly into it, but yeah. no, no problem. <laughs> um, for private credit, uh, by and large, we manage about four hundred fifty billion dollars of credit as it is. We're the largest alternative yeah. credit provider. Um, we chose to, mo to focus our platform on senior credit. Okay. Um, the way that we've done that is we've invested about eight billion dollars of our own capital buying origination platforms. So these are the businesses that banks used to own. These are the businesses regional banks used to be in. It's trade finance, it's aircraft leasing, it's um, lending to planes, trains, automobiles, consumers. And so we own now 16 of these that originate senior credit for us every single day. And so for the last 15 years, we've been building this business and we're the largest. We also at Apollo provide um, senior capital to investment grade companies. Yeah. So we did a multi-billion dollar deal for AT&T, we did a multi-billion dollar deal for Adnoc, a multi-billion dollar deal for AB InBev. And that's because they were looking for capital that the banks are no longer providing. And it's not plain vanilla where the markets easily digest it. Right. They needed something tailored and bespoke and so we were able to step up with our capital and, and provide that. What are you seeing in terms of demand uh, in the private credit space right now? I mean, it seems like institutional funding has, has at least dried up a bit. Are wealthy investors, are they kind of stepping into that role in some way? Look, there's, a, there's significant demand by companies and consumers for mm. private credit, again, because the banks have really pulled back, yeah. especially in the U.S. And the regional bank business model is still in question of what it's going to be over the course of the next several years. And so private capital is stepping into that. From an investor perspective, absolutely. I mean, there's a, there's a, a, a once-in-a-generation shift from equity value to credit. And in private credit, when you can earn top of the capital structure 12, 13 percent, and then investment grade mid to high single digits, that's, that, those look like pretty good yields when you compare that to what long-term equity returns have been. Mm -hmm. And so that's why our investment strategy has been on senior credit and also on hybrid, which is senior equity. Geographic focus this year for you would be which bits? Like, what, what are you guys busy with right now? So our business has been very active in the U.S. and Europe. Mm -hmm. um, deal activity for the whole sector has been down in Asia, given that the relative value of what the U.S. has offered has been much better. Mm -hmm. The rate, Fed raised rates 500 basis points. Yeah. Um, Asia can't, didn't can't need to. can argue with that. A Asia didn't need to because, you know, a the Asian central banks didn't print as much money. They didn't expand the balance sheet as much, so they didn't have to raise rates as much over the last two years to fight inflation. Uh, the, cent the U.S. did, and so that dichotomy has created a bit of a, a, a challenge in relative value, but you've seen deal activity pick up quite a bit mm. across Asia. We've seen a lot of activity in India. We're seeing uh, activity come back to life in Australia, and we're seeing a lot of activity in Japan as well. Mm. Um, in terms of deals, I mean, are, are, are the deal sizes in Asia a little bit smaller now as well? And, and are you looking, are you able to look for those investment grade opportunities out there? We, um, there are large deals to do in Asia. So we just recently announced a big carve out from Panasonic, one of their big businesses that make cockpit systems for, for cars. Mm. Um, a year and a half ago, we did a $750 million deal for the Mumbai airport. Um, we do, but, but, but by and large, you do need to be, there are going to be smaller deal sizes in Asia because you have to be local. I mean, the big change in the Asian markets over the last 10 years is the local markets have gotten very sophisticated on the equity side and on the private credit side, filling in the gaps where the mm -hmm. banks are not. And so you have to be local to be able to source those deals. If the deal is large, it's going to typically come to the big deal centers like Hong Kong or Singapore or maybe even New York and London. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, the deal sizes will be, will be smaller, but you'll also find some very large deals to do. How, how small do you guys go? <laughs> in other words, what would you leave to the others? Um, it, 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 depend, it depends on the risk reward. So at okay. Apollo, we tend to do $100 million and up. Mm. But we do a lot of smaller deals through our platforms. So we own a stake in MaxCap, yeah, which right. is a real estate development lender down in Australia. Their average ticket size could be anywhere from 10 to $50 million. Mm. We own When we bought Credit Suisse's securitized products business, that came along with a great Australian, uh, Australian business that Anthony Herman is now leading. Mm. And we'll do small deals out of that platform. Um, and so through our platforms, we'll do smaller deals. At Apollo, we tend to, to stick to the, the large, slightly larger deals, 100 million and up here in Asia. Uh, I want to get your take on China. Obviously, this is the China show, but um, are you looking at China as an attractive investment uh, venue or even just for capital raising right now? Look, the headlines, if you look at the headlines, we always start with where are the banks trading? And the banks are trading at somewhere around 0.2, 0.3 times book. That's a good reflection of 
investor sentiment. Whether, real, whether that's reality or not, it's a reflection of investor sentiment. Right. What that tells us is that obviously the property sector was 20% plus of the economy. It won't be 20% plus of the economy going forward. It was, a, it was a big driver of the economy. But we do see a lot of green shoots in, in China. We, you know, if you look at all of our portfolio, private equity portfolio companies and hybrid value portfolio companies, we would be the size of Ford in the, globally. Um, and all of those businesses are doing a very productive business in China today. We have about 10,000 employees in, it, through our portfolio companies in China, over $5 billion of revenue, and they're seeing great growth. They're seeing growth in auto, auto supply, logistics, warehousing, so on and so forth. So there are really interesting things in China to get excited about, but the point two times price the book in the property sector overhang is it's going to take some time before sentiment turns around. Mm -hmm. And how are you probing that demand right now? Is it through private wealth, wealth managers here in Hong Kong? So we, execute, we will execute deals through our hybrid strategy. So China obviously has a very robust banking system and they have a very sophisticated equity system now, both domestic and foreign players. Um, our job is to provide the capital in the middle that, that isn't easily provided. Um, but and going to your question about our, our wealth business, we've absolutely seen demand from Asian investors generally who have been heavily allocated to real estate and domestic equities here in Asia um, demanding credit, um, global credit. Um, so we have a, a, a semi-liquid private credit vehicle that has done very well out here in Asia through our private bank channels. Um, and you know, when you can get top of the capital structure, again, low, low double-digit returns, that's a pretty good alternative when you're looking at um, equity, the equity outlook here in Asia or even where real estate prices are going. Yeah, and also given the state of the equity market, uh, that as well. When you look at your portfolio companies, just to get a sense of how the economy is doing, for example, or the greater economy, are you seeing any particular signs of uh, repayment stress or are things business as usual, for example? Things are by and large business as usual for us because in our private equity business, we always, uh, we've always had a purchase price matters mentality. We always buy, thing, buy good companies at six to seven times EBITDA. That means we need to roll up our sleeves quite a bit <laughs> to find good companies at those prices, but that's what we've been able to do for 35 years. Um, and so as a result, we also lever these companies much less. Right. And so we don't, we don't feel... This, I mean, of course, we feel the increase in cost of capital, but we feel it less than if you'd bought something for 20 times, levered it 10 times, and you were really hoping on low rates to preserve your terminal value multiple, right. and you were hoping that the cost of, of capital didn't go up in terms of the cash flow coverage for your debt. So, um, yes, we certainly feel a little bit of the, co the cost of capital increase, but our purchase price matters discipline has, has really helped us. How much has your cost of capital gone up the last you know, since the Fed started raising interest rates. And I'm wondering, has that affected really just your universe of uh, possibilities at this point? Um, it's, it, so on the, on the equity side yeah. specifically, um, it actually hasn't. So one of our biggest deployment years was in private equity was last year, mm -hmm. mostly because the financing markets weren't available for large deals. Um, and so we were able to find creative ways to finance these buyouts and finance these transactions. Yeah. And then you take advantage of market opportunities like in uh, January, February, where you had a record issuance of IG, record issuance of, of, of credit in the public markets, yeah. and you refinance into lo a lower cost of capital. Um, can you talk to us a little more about other geographies like India, Japan, obviously. I mean, there's, there's so much hype about both these markets here right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, what benchmark metrics are you, are you using to determine if these markets are, are going to deliver? Yeah, so Mark, our CEO, has, has said that Japan is one of our most important markets outside of the U.S., and, and for, for really good reason. It's interesting. You look, for the last 20 years, it's obviously, we've obviously been in deflation, or at least noflation. And if you're a consumer, the rational thing to do is to hold cash. So they've held 50 to 55% cash for the average consumer, 25% in domestic equities, and then 25% in other. But if you look over the last 20 years, that means that their portfolio has gone up on only 1.2 times versus the average saver in Europe or the average saver in the U.S. went up two and a half times. But now you have inflation coming in, both domestic as well as imported. You also have something else that happened over the last 20 years. People got older. And so in the time, in, their, in the period where savers could have been allocated to beta, allocated to risk, that's when they should have done that. But now that they are ready to retire, failure is not really an option on the yeah. investment side. Huh. And so what they're looking for is they're looking for safe, guaranteed product that can generate alpha, generate excess return, because they're now facing inflation for the first time in 20 years. And the government needs this because you think about it, it's uh, over 50% of uh, Japan's GDP is consumer driven. But if you have a bunch of retirees who are worried about, worried about inflation and invested in cash, you're not going to get people spending. 
And so you've seen the government really focus on asset management reform to bring good, qual good high quality investment products to the average Japanese saver. And we've announced partnerships with Nomura and Sumi Trust, and we have a, a very fast growing business for our, through our retirement services, Armathene, in Japan.